history tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to the History Goes Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And we are still road tripping 2015. Our last stop here that we just finished was in St. Charles, Missouri. What did you think of St. Charles? Oh my gosh, what a neat, neat little old downtown area. Loved it. The downtown in St. Charles is not only a neat place to go shopping, but a lot of the structures down there are original, very old, and really neat architecture. And I got to go on a ghost tour while we were there. Denise was supposed to come too, but uh, some of our plans fell through and we didn't have anybody to watch the dog, so only one of us got to do it and uh, she drew the short straw. So she got to babysit dogs while I got to go on the ghost tour. And it was with Michael Henry, who is a fabulous historian. I would say he's probably the authority on St. Charles history mixed with the ghost stories that go with it. Had a great time. Before we get into that, we want to tell you a little bit about the history of St. Charles. The first Western settler who built a permanent structure in St. Charles did so in about 1750. The settlement was named Les Petites Côtes, which is French for Little Hills. And this is a hilly area for sure. Once this permanent structure was built, there was a bit of a dispute over who owned the property there. So there could have been a big bloody battle over this, but instead, the first guy who was there decided to move on. They're not sure who he was, they just know that he was French, and he was married to a Native American. In 1769, Louis Blanchett built a log cabin in what would become known as St. Charles, and he did so on the banks of the Missouri River. St. Charles does stand along the banks there, and most people probably know that one of the reasons why St. Charles is well known is because it's associated with the Lewis and Clark expedition, and there's a lot of history around that when it comes to St. Charles. A lot of the economy in this early part of St. Charles' history was around fur trading, and there was a lot of trade that they would do with Native Americans in the area. As a matter of fact, the first fur transaction goes like this. I received from Jean-Baptiste Pillier for the account of Baptist Point du Sable three packs of cats, six deer skins, and color of which are, question mark, couldn't read it, a dozen eggs from Monsieur Pellier for having brought the three packs from Chicago the 30th of June, 1796, for Francois Duguay. This was written by John Baptiste Gijon. Now, Blanchet, who had built that first log cabin there, became one of the first three commandants who was appointed by the Spanish. In 1793, the log cabin was taken down and a brick structure was built where Blanchet's home had been. Today, that structure is the oldest existing structure in St. Charles. And on the tour, we got to go by this location. And in the back, you can see where they've done a lot of excavation. And they say that some of the stuff that they found there, tracing back to the Native Americans who were originally in the area, is changing the way history was written. Apparently, there was a lot of trading that went on all the way down into South America, which a lot of people did not realize until they started excavating the backyard at this settlement. The first church that was built in St. Charles was built in 1791. It was dedicated to San Carlos Bormier. Now, this church no longer exists there, but they have built a reproduction of it. And they think it's pretty close to the original. Unfortunately, they didn't have any pictures of it, so they had to go based on drawings and handwritten descriptions. But they think they've got it pretty much the way it should look. It was also in 1791 when St. Charles came to be known as San Carlos de Missouri which is St. Charles of the Missouri. Daniel Boone and his family were the first American-born Europeans to settle in this area. And there is a statue of Daniel Boone that's down there along the main street in St. Charles. Missouri finally became a state in 1821. 
And St. Charles, actually, a lot of people may not know this, was the original capital for Missouri. It also happens to be the second oldest city in Missouri, and it is one of the oldest cities in the United States. The temporary state capital that was here in St. Charles was there until 1826. There is a hardware store, and it still has the sign there, that belonged to the Peck family, and they allowed the legislature to hold meetings in the rooms that were above their store. The site is now one of the smallest state parks in Missouri. So the building and there's a little grassy area behind it. And one of the neat things that uh, Michael Henry showed us while we were doing the tour is they'd done some excavating back there and they'd found some of the original walls. And they believe that one of the smaller areas in the back was a cell. And they found some African-American bones back there. And it's something that they don't like to talk about. And a lot of cities don't like to talk about these jails that they had because they were for runaway slaves. And after the Civil War, people didn't want to admit that they were capturing runaway slaves and putting them in jail. And so St. Charles tried to keep this a secret, but after archaeologists got a hold of it, they were able to prove that, yes, they did keep runaway slaves in this cell that they had near the state capitol building. In 1865, slavery was finally abolished in the United States. And to its credit, Missouri is the first state that formally freed its slaves. In St. Louis, many people may not know this, it was kind of split in two. If you could get across the Missouri River and you were a slave, you were free if you could get to the other side. And so it was split right there. St. Charles also came into prominence in 1904 because of the Chicago's World Fair. It was very close to the World Fair. And they built a special road that would provide a route to the World's Fair. So a lot of people would pass through St. Charles or stay in St. Charles on their way to the World's Fair. Streetcar service also started at that time in St. Charles. I would have loved to have seen what that looked like, Denise. Oh, that would have been very, very cool. Like I said, this is definitely one of the locations I want to go back to. Just rich in history, rich in hauntings, and and just very quaint shops. Rich in shopping ladies. Now, of course, an old city that is full of crime and violence and there's been tornadoes and floods and lots of brothels got to have lots of hauntings right and sure enough St. Charles does now one of the things that we've mentioned many times that are seen in many places almost every city has its own story is a tale about a lady in white and why is this woman that we're about to talk about known as the lady in white Um, She was wearing her wedding dress when she was buried because it was the nicest dress that she owned. Michael Henry has an ancestor that he had a letter from who had lived in the area. It was an interesting letter because it talks about St. Charles back in the 1800s and how it stunk a lot because it was basically a swamp when it was first established. There was a cemetery that was put right down there in the middle of the city because nobody wanted to live down there because it was a swamp. When they filled it in, the uh, land became worth something. So they ended up moving this huge cemetery elsewhere and having to move a lot of the bodies. Of course, not everybody got moved, and we know people don't like being moved around. And the lady in white has a little something to do with this. Now, Michael Henry's ancestor was named Hiram Barry, and he had written this letter home in 1922. In the letter, it's a great way of keeping track of what happened with history because there was a cholera epidemic that it hit at this same time, too, and it was killing a lot of people. And apparently, Hiram was talking about how he didn't feel very good, so he probably was a victim of the cholera as well. In his letter, he mentions a mass grave that was dug that they had to put at least 40 bodies into. Over time, that area is flooded, so those bodies are probably gone to history, been washed away. He also mentions in his letter a woman. He doesn't say a name, but he mentions that she's 23 years old, that she'd been married for little more than a year, and that she was pregnant. And then she gives birth to a beautiful boy baby. And he seems very affectionate about this woman. He wrote, she did not have a hard time, but fever set in. And the evening before she died, she got delirious. She did not know anyone for 24 hours before she died. She was so proud of her baby. She never thought she would die. Never said anything, but she wanted the priest. He came the day she got delirious. And she, of course, did pass away from cholera. There was a huge funeral that was held for her. So she must have been well loved. But there must not have been a lot of money because she was put into a potter's field and Hiram had written in his letter that he needed to get out of town 
so Michael Henry surmises that the reason why he needed to get out of town and why he'd been so affectionate about this woman and the baby was that probably he had gotten her knocked up and that the baby was his. And that's why there was some issue there. As Denise mentioned, she was buried in her wedding dress because she was poor, and that was the nicest dress that she had. Michael Henry writes in his book, and I highly recommend you get it, it's Ghosts of St. Charles. It's one of the Haunted America collection, and I've been collecting these books for a while now. Over the years, a number of people report that while standing on the sidewalk at what was once the entrance to the cemetery looking up the hill, they see a woman in a long white dress standing quietly, perhaps praying, in front of a reconstructed church. They approach, she looks up, looks at them, and then fades away or glides out of sight behind the building. This apparition, the Lady in White, is the best documented and perhaps the most frequently glimpsed ghostly visitor in the area. And of course, as we all know, what is the holy grail of ghost hunting, Denise? Full body apparitions, of course. She is always seen right around sunset and fades away with the fading daylight. Some say it looks as if she's holding a glass of wine. Others remark that she smiles but still seems so sad. And this church is the Borromeo Church. They've built the reconstructed one. But this church had the cemetery around it and there still are some bodies that are buried there to this day. They've decided that they didn't want to move them, which I agree with. Let's not disturb those that are dead. Especially since we know you don't want to ever tempt the spirits. Another interesting thing about St. Charles history, there's this along Main Street, there's a building called the Old Post Office. Behind it is a parking lot. They used to hold public hangings, public executions in this parking lot. They became a big deal. They did it all the way up until 1904, and it was a public spectacle. People would bring out picnics. They would have games. It was a big deal when they would have these public hangings. Of course, remember, they didn't have other distractions like cable and I don't know. But still, think about it. I don't know that I would be like going, oh, let's take a picnic and watch somebody get hung. Yeah, I don't know who does that. We've discussed that many times, Denise. (laughs) Some people, I just, you know, I guess back in Rome, they enjoyed watching the gladiators kill each other and stuff. So that area, of course, is haunted. There's a little girl. She was about nine. She lived along this street in a house on the corner And about three houses down from there, she was found dead in a fire that had completely destroyed a home there. They're not sure why she was at the home, because it was not her house. And they also wonder if she didn't start the fire. But she still haunts this area to this day. And what it is now, there's no home there. It's an outdoor eating area. People who've sat there say they sometimes feel a cold hand touch them. She has been seen as a full-body apparition. She likes to go into women's purses and pull things out of there. She will occasionally go into the restaurant, move things around in there as well. She had a sewing machine that was a toy, and it was kept down in the building that had been her home, which became a clothing store. And they found the sewing machine stored downstairs. They brought it up and thought it was neat. So they kept it by their counter in the front so that people could see it. They would come in the following morning and they would find that sewing machine moved. Sometimes it was on shelves that they couldn't reach without getting on a ladder. So they think the little girl was moving it around. When the clothing store closed down its business, the sewing machine went home with somebody. They don't know who. And a lot of people wonder if she's not attached to that sewing machine and possibly haunting wherever that is now today as well. Lindenwood University is up the hill. There are reportedly some ghosts that like to hang out there as well. One of the coolest things that I liked about this tour is a lot of people, you've watched CSI, you know about biological evidence. Michael told us all, if you're going to murder somebody, don't do it over wood or any kind of concrete or masonry. And thank you for giving hints to our listeners about what to do or not do when they murder people. (laughs) As we've discussed, not only does masonry soak up the energy of the spirits, but it soaks up blood too, and you can't get rid of it. Now, a lot of people know that they use luminol to spray on different places, and then they use a, a sort of, it's like a blue light so that it lights up the luminol and you can see where blood splatters are. Well, you can do the same thing with black lights and you don't have to use luminol. There was a sheriff who was repentant. I don't know if it was because of the executions that he was carrying out, but one day he decided to commit suicide. He did so. He lived on the second floor of this building. He was up on the balcony. He shot himself in the head, but he didn't do a very good job of it. He blew off part of his face, but he didn't kill himself right away. He stumbled through the 
upstairs. He goes down the stairs and he wanders through this alleyway that's between two buildings. And I would say it's no more than two feet across. He gets all the way to the end of the alley, slumps over on the ground and bleeds out. He's dead. Today, that alley is still there. There's a gate that's in front of it. The floor is no longer dirt. It's concrete. So you can't see the blood that's there, but you can see a blood splatter that's on the masonry on the wall next to this area. And Michael had a black light with him. He shined it on this area. And sure enough, you can see a huge blood splatter. And then there's these lines running down from it where you can see the blood streaking down. He says that during the summer when the sun penetrates through to that alleyway, it lights that up. And for some reason, it absorbs that light and it makes it fluorescent so you can see it. There's also bats that live in the alley, and there's crews that have to come through and clean up the the bat dew. And when they do it, the material they use is the same stuff that's used in luminol. And so it again penetrates into this blood stain and just it helps to keep it alive. So this blood stain has lasted all of this time and can still be seen to this day. Apparently, his ghost does haunt this alleyway. And we were carrying around EMF detectors, and they were going off as we stood near that gate. There also are a couple of dogs that haunt the area. They believe they belong to Lewis and Clark when they had their expedition. They had Newfoundlands with them, and they absolutely loved and adored these dogs. When they died, apparently their spirits got attached to the street there. They have been seen by people, only it's their upper bodies, not their legs. Because the reason why is because the street used to be 18 inches lower than the current street now. So the dogs apparently are walking on the original road, and that's why you can't see their legs. Michael said he's never seen them, but when a mist or a fog that's really thick comes in, occasionally he will see dark figures moving through it, and he wonders if that's not the dogs. They have been heard barking along the street, and there is definitely energy that they throw off. We did get some hits on our EMF when we were standing in the street in the area where they are supposed to frequent it. So that's just a little brief history of St. Charles, Missouri and some of the hauntings there. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Next one up will be Nashville. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. 